microphone, are you working? I think you are. Hey everyone, this is Nicholas. We're doing another live stream, a live Q&A. We're answering questions about Chinese medicine, acupuncture, herbs, starting a practice, all that kind of stuff. I thought before we do that, we could go over some books, specifically some non-textbook books, or like books you could read for fun. Um, I think this is a good way if you're wanting to learn more about Chinese medicine. It can be good to read books outside of uh, the classroom. Also, sometimes it just gets boring reading textbooks all the time, so sometimes it's good to have something that you can read for fun, something that you can just kind of read and not have to worry about memorizing things to take a test, that you can just kind of sit back and enjoy what you're reading and do it in more of a casual way. Also, I think for a lot of people, the semester is about to end and they're going on break, so maybe this is a way that you could uh, still be engaged in Chinese medicine, have something fun to read, and not be, feel like you're studying a textbook. So if Christmas is coming up and you want to get, get a gift for an acupuncturist, or if you're like me and at Christmas time you just buy gifts for yourself, uh, these are some possibilities. All the books we're going to talk about are linked in the description below. Full disclosure, these are Amazon affiliate links, so that means if you click on those links and buy anything, I'll receive a small commission. It's like less than 5%, but that's a way you can support the channel, support the website at no additional cost to you. Actually, the way it works is if you like click on an Amazon affiliate link, it sets a cookie for 24 hours, and if you buy anything in that 24-hour period, then it gives that person a commission. So even if you're not buying these books, that's that's a way you can support the channel. Uh, speaking of Christmas gifts, I made a t-shirt just for fun because I thought it was funny. Uh, if you're not into The Mandalorian, this might not, might not make sense. Uh, this is the character for Dao, and this is the way. Dao means the way, as in Daoism or the Dao De Jing. So this is the character for Dao. So I thought it was kind of funny. So I made a t-shirt. So if you're here on the chat, let me know if you read books outside of class, if you have books that you like to read, or if you're here on the replay, let me know in the comments, what are some non-textbook books about Chinese medicine that you like to read? What are some things that you like? What are some things that you don't like? Uh, if you have textbooks, which are the textbooks that you don't like? Because we'll probably talk about that too. But um, let's talk about some books. So the first one I always recommend is Applied Channel Theory by Wang Juyi. This is one that I talk about in other videos a lot, and this is my favorite book about Chinese medicine. And sometimes I say it's my favorite non-book book about Chinese medicine, but it's one of my favorite books about Chinese medicine. So I feel like this book really fills in a lot of gaps about things that you might not learn in school. I feel like a lot of schools are very Zhang Fu focused, so we focus a lot on the patterns associated with the organs, and then when you learn acupuncture points, a lot of people treat the acupuncture points like buttons that address certain things. And so this really fills in some of those gaps and it talks about channel theory, kind of a bridge between Zhang Fu and just thinking about acupuncture point functions. When you think about channel theory, we're talking about the channels as part of the body's physiology. And so this kind of fills in some of those gaps that I feel like many, a lot of Western or American schools you might not get in your regular curriculum. Uh, so this is something that it starts out going over um, the regular that goes through the six channels. It doesn't go through them in order. I think it was Tai Yin, Xiao Yin, Jue Yin, and then Tai Yang, Xiao Yang, Yang Ming. But it talks about just the six channels. Then it talks about the divergent channels. It talks about the eight extraordinary channels and kind of gives some more information about those as far as, it, as far as the body's physiology goes. It talks about point categories, like the five shoe transport points. It talks about point combinations, how we can create point, uh, point pairs based on the five phases or based on six channel theory. Um, and then it also, what's really cool is it talks about channel palpation. And I feel like, at least when I went to school, this was not necessarily something we talked a whole lot about, is how to palpate the channels diagnostically. 
And so he talks about some things that what you're feeling for, what kind of uh, diagnostic significance they have, and things like that. So there's a lot in this book, and I think it's all really good. It's something that you can skip around to if you want to. If you're if you need to review five shoe transport points, you can go to the chapter on five shoe transport points. If you want to just uh, sit down and read it, you can do that too. He has a lot of stories and quotes and Q and A in it. So this is really my favorite book. Um, and what you can do is if you go on Amazon, kind of a cool thing. If you go on Amazon, if you look in the upper corner here where it has the thumbnail, there's a button that look inside. See if I can make this work. Maybe this work. Sorry, I'm a little laggy apparently. You can click you can click this button that says look inside and then that will give you a preview of the book and it actually gives you quite a few pages. So if you're looking at these books and you kind of want to know, I mean this book is $75. That's when you're a student, that's kind of a big investment. So you can kind of look through some of the pages and see if this is something that is really worth it. But uh, like I said, this is this is one of my favorite books about Chinese medicine. I would say um, if you're just starting out, this book might be a little bit much. Um, I had a points class where they had this as a required textbook in points one, and I feel like maybe this is a bit much for one student. But if you're like in points three where you're reviewing all of the channels, or if you're starting to get into the clinic, then this can be a really good book to kind of put everything together. This is something that when I first read it, like every chapter, I was like, oh my god, that makes so much sense. Why didn't anybody ever explain it to me like this before? And I have recommend this to other people and they have the same reaction. There's, there's like gems in every chapter. And if you read it, um, each time you read it, you'll be able to find something new. So this is by far my most recommended book to anyone about Chinese medicine. I guess I could also say that um, this is this. Then another reason is, like I said, it goes into channel theory, which is not something we usually talk about, or it's the way that most practitioners think. I feel like there are mediocre practitioners. There are mediocre practitioners who just think of points in terms of buttons that treat symptoms or diseases, like oh, this is the point for you know, this is the point for headache. Then you have slightly better practitioners that think more about patterns, that this point tonifies blood, this point clears heat. Um, something like Wang Ji channel theory, we're, we're talking more about the dynamics of the channels and the channels as part of the physiology. And so we're not thinking about the points in terms of buttons that fix problems. We're thinking about the points as how we, how we affect the qi dynamic in the body. How can we alter the flow of qi to bring things back into balance. And so that's a really cool thing that Wang Ji goes into that you might not have experienced in your classes. So that's my favorite book. So that's, and that's mostly about acupuncture. Next one is more about herbs. This is 10 Key Formula Families in China by Huang Huang. Let's see if I have a better picture of this. 10 Key Formula Families in Chinese Medicine. And so this is really, this is really cool by Huang Huang. Uh, this is about herbal formulas, and what I like about this is it takes a different approach. It approaches formulas from a slightly different angle. At least when I learned uh, those in school, we talked about the formulas in category. So we had formulas that release the exterior, formulas that clear heat, formulas that tonify. He, in this book, talks about formulas in terms of families, and so he has 10 major families based on the key ingredients. So like he has the a uh, guajer family of formulas, so cinnamon twig formula family. So he has all the formulas that are based on guajer, like guajer tong, guajer jia futsa tong, all the all those things, xiao jian zhong tong, dang gui si ni tong, jirgan sao tong, guajer fu ling wan. So instead of thinking about the formulas in terms of what they treat, we can think more about how the formula is constructed and how different variations of these formulas treat different things. And then what's also cool is um, he, for each, uh, each herb family or each formula family, he talks about a constitution associated with those, 
that family. So instead of thinking it like signs and symptoms for each one, he'll say like a cinnamon twig constitution. The body tends to be thin. The skin is comparatively fair with a fine texture. The flesh appears moist and firm. The patient sweats easily or has spontaneous sweating, night sweating, sweaty palms and soles. In addition, the patient has a physical sensitivity to cold temperatures, frequent colds, tendency towards abdominal pain, things like that. So instead of saying this formula treats this pattern or this formula treats this symptom, he, he kind of organized like you can look at the patient's constitution and say that this is a Guajer constitution, this is a Bansha constitution, this is a Shurgao constitution. And so then when we look at that constitution, we can think there's this family of formulas that can treat this constitution and we'll just pick a formula based on what signs and symptoms they're presenting with or what specifically specific disharmony is presenting within that constitution. So it's a really interesting way to look at herbs, uh, herbal formulas. Um, I would say this is maybe not when I talk about fun books to read it's maybe not like super fun it's still you're still kind of reading it like a textbook almost but uh, if you're especially if you're like reviewing for boards this might be a good way to look at herbal formulas but again looking at them from a slightly different direction instead of look instead of going category by category we can think what are these formulas based on their major herb Ten key formula families by Huang Huang. The next one I just got this recently is Li Shijun's Pulse Studies. I think I have a better picture of this too. Li Shijun's uh, Pulse Studies. And so this is a uh, Pulse Study book. And it's, and it's something I got relatively recently. I, I don't think this was around when I was in school or I didn't know about it when I was in school. When we were in school, we used this one, the uh, uh, Bob Fluck. Secret of Chinese Pulse Diagnosis. I also do like this book, especially reading the introduction, and he has very good descriptions of the pulses. This one, I feel like it's, the format is kind of the same. It goes through the pulse descriptions. Uh, it goes through the combinations when you have two different pulse images occurring simultaneously. It goes through what each of the pulses means diagnostically. But what's cool about this book is it has pictures. Let's see if I have a picture of that. Computer's really laggy. So it has, it has actually pictures of all the pulses in, as waveforms. And you can see that it has, uh, over here up top, you can see it has the waveform as it's going through the vessel. One peak, uh, no, it's uh, one waveform is what happens during one breath. So each peak is a, is a, a heartbeat during one breath and then it also has a cross section so this is good pulse if you're like more of a visual person in terms of learning pulse this can be uh kind of cool uh that's something that the the bob flaws book doesn't have so i think this is kind of cool uh, i haven't read through the whole thing but i liked flipping through and looking at the picture so if you're if you want to get more into pulse diagnosis and you're a visual person and uh, a lot of these pulse descriptions don't make sense maybe having a picture of it will help you out so that's one i got recently another one i like i've been recommending is this book the yellow monkey emperor's Classic of Chinese medicine, the Yellow Monkey Emperor's Classic of Chinese medicine. I think I have a better picture of this too. Computer. So this is a really cute book. Um, you, based on the title, you might think that it's about the Huangdi Neijing. It's actually not, but this is a really cute book. It has a. It's in like a comic book form. It's Chinese medicine as a comic book. And like I said, you might think it's more about the Huangdi Neijing. It's actually not. What it does is it goes through each of the Zhang Fu patterns. And so what this was is one of the authors, when he was in school, he tended to doodle a lot in school and make drawings. And that was his way of studying was to make cute drawings. And that's how he remembered things. And so this is kind of a compilation of those doodles. So it's going through all of the Zhang Fu patterns. And each one has... A little comic associated with it. So right here, this is a, a little pig who's experiencing liver chi stagnation. So she's describing all of her symptoms. And then uh, after each little comic, it has 
just a page listing the signs and symptoms associated with liver tea stagnation. So this kind of reminds me of the zoo cards. If anybody's used the zoo cards for herbs, where it has each herb is associated with an animal, this kind of does the same thing where it has a little story for each pattern, and then it has a little, a little animal and a cute picture for each pattern. So this just goes through all of the Zong Fu patterns. So I'll be about this one. I got this because it was really cute. I asked some other people if they had ever heard of this book, and somebody said to me, yes, I got this book because it looked really cool, but honestly, I flipped through it once and then never really looked at it very much again. And I kind of did the same thing. It's, it's kind of weird to just sit down and read it. What I think you can do is this could be a very good, um, you can use it like a study guide or a workbook. And so what you can do is go through each of those Zong Fu patterns that we have. So when you see liver chi stagnation, you can all it has is the signs and symptoms. It doesn't have any points. It doesn't have any herbs. I think it does have tongue and pulse. But what you can do is go and cross-reference this with your Machiocha, because the Machiocha goes through all of the Zong Fu patterns. And so you can find the Zong Fu pattern, then uh, go and in the book, it has a lot of space, you can write in the point prescription and you can make sure that you know why each point is treating that pattern. And then you can go write in the herbal formula and make sure you know why that formula is treating that pattern. So this is something that maybe I wouldn't just sit down and read it a whole lot just, just for giggles, but it is something that you can, um, it might be fun to use as a workbook. So we have stomach food retention. So maybe maybe down here you can you can look up stomach food retention in Machiocha and write down the point prescription for it, what points you would use, like Ren 12 or whatever, and then the formula, probably Baohuan, and you can try to make some connections between the points used in the, in the Machiocha point prescription and the pattern and the symptoms and the herbs. So I think this would be more fun like that. But it's also really cute. And this is another one that you can go on Amazon. And if you click at that look inside button, when the thumbnail pops up right above it, there's a button that says look inside. You can click on that and it'll actually give you a lot of pages. So the first part is mostly text and it gives you a nice introduction to Chinese medicine. And then it has little uh, comic strips about each of the Zong Fu patterns. So that's another one you, you can go and look at the preview online and see if it's something you're really into. I've been going on about books and ignoring the chat, so sorry if you've been saying things in the chat. Not that one. Hello from Canada. Hi, Britain from Canada. Uh, yeah, I really, really liked the episode yesterday. We won't spoil it for people who haven't seen it. Veronica's here from... Hi, Veronica. Oh, Stephen, all the way from Chengdu. Yeah, I, I had a, I, I'm looking at the wrong camera. I had a teacher from Chengdu. And so I really want to go to Chengdu and maybe to study Chinese medicine at Chengdu University, but also maybe just to eat Sichuan. Get some Hui Guoro. I think in Sichuan they eat more not noodles, so I might have to go to Beijing to eat noodles. Uh, Basil says, I purchased the book. I'm assuming you mean the Wang Zhuyi book. Yeah, I really like that book. It's, people kind of say it's a lot, it's, you know, $75, it's a lot, but it's, I feel like it's worth it. It's something that you'll read over and over. I need to remember uh, to look at the right camera. Xavier, Xavier, i um, glad you like the t-shirt. This was, this was, I just kind of thought about this one day after uh, uh, watching The Mandalorian. Hi, Donna. Okay, looks like Jen jumped in late today. So yeah, we're doing a Q&A, but we're also talking about uh, some books that you can read for fun. Uh, just if you're going on break soon and you want to read some books for fun, these are some kind of nice non-textbook books. If you want to read a book but not have to worry about passing a test afterwards, that can be kind of a fun way to keep studying Chinese medicine. If you need to buy Christmas presents, this can be good Christmas presents for uh, your acupuncturist friends. Or like I said, like me, I just buy presents for myself. And that's, that's like an excuse to buy things at Christmas. 
Um, so, so those are some books I have. Some other ones I want to mention is this book, Ari Donna. I'm not using your mug. I'm just using this one because it's bigger, and so I won't have to keep refilling it. But I do use your mugs. This is, uh, this is a book that was written by a couple of my teachers and one of my teacher's uh, partners. Um, Ancient Wisdom Modern Kitchen is a cookbook about Chinese medicine. And this is one that I don't have the physical copy with me because I gave it to my parents. And I guess I say that because this is a really good book and it's very good. You can read it yourself, but it's also very good to recommend to other people who are interested in Chinese medicine or if you have patients that you want to like recommend some food therapy, this is an easy book to give them. So it kind of, the, the first part goes over some uh, basic food therapy theory, some about the, the energetics of foods in terms of Chinese medicine, but it's by and large just a cookbook. It has recipes. And what's nice about it is it was written for Westerners in mind, for non for non Chinese people. It was written for people who don't necessarily know a lot about Chinese medicine, and it was written to be a cookbook. Uh, a lot of the books you see on food therapy, even if they're recipe books, the recipes are not really precise. I think in the West we're used to like very precise directions and very precise measurements. Um, and so a lot of a lot of the some of the Chinese books aren't aren't really that precise. And it also talks a lot about the ingredients. And if there are if there are unfamiliar ingredients, it talks about how to get those and where you can get those. So sometimes when you just get books about uh, Chinese food therapy, it's it can be very vague or can use some ingredients that people are like, I have no idea what that is or where to get. This book was written with Western Westerners in mind in terms of explaining how to make the food and where to get the ingredients. So it's really good. To, it's really good to give to patients. It's really good. Uh, like I said, I gave it to my parents. It's good to give to your family members. If your family members are kind of interested in Chinese medicine, this can be a way to like ease them into it through cooking. And um, it's also like they chose recipes that taste good. Uh, again, this was for like Americans and for Westerners. There's if you have like boiled pig feet or pork liver or pork kidneys, a lot of Americans don't want to eat that. They chose recipes that would taste good and are not too unusual to a Western palate. So it's a really good book, and I especially recommend it a lot to um, my patients when I want to give them food therapy. Uh, I made a video about uh, sesame balls a year or two ago uh, with black sesame and walnut using honey to stick them together. That actually came from this book. There's It's kind of a modified recipe from this book. But he has a lot of things like that, either like he has teas, snacky things. Um, I say he. I should really think it was, it was more Mika and Yuan Wong than Warren. Sorry, Warren. I shouldn't say that. Um, it was it was a collective effort by by three people. And so they have some, some snacky stuff, they have some breakfast stuff, they have some teas, and they also have some main dishes. They have like a, a silver wrapped fish, they have a stir fried asparagus with goji berries and things like that, and it kind of incorporates some Chinese herbs. So definitely recommend that book. Also makes a good gift. This last one I'll throw in here, just for fun. I actually haven't read this book, The Spark in the Machine. I haven't read it, but I've heard a lot about it, and so it's kind of on my to do, uh, on my list of things that I want to read. And just the reason I brought this one up, um, I guess first I should say, The Spark in the Machine, it's by um, an acupuncturist, and he's relating traditional Chinese medicine to Western medicine, and specifically embryology. And so I think this started as he had a, uh, an MD ask him, how does acupuncture work? How does Chinese medicine work? And he tried to come answer, and this book is like an expansion of that answer of how we can think about Chinese traditional Chinese medicine in Western terms, specifically like with the channels and embryology. But the reason I bring this one up is there's actually an audiobook av version available of this, and I just feel like there aren't a lot of audiobooks about Chinese medicine. And so what's cool here is if you go on to Amazon, like if you click below and you select the audiobook. It, you can get a free trial of Audible, and that free trial I think gives you two free audiobooks. And basically, there aren't a lot of uh, audiobooks about Chinese medicine, so it's those two free books. 
cancel your, your free trial, you still get to keep the book, and now you have an audiobook. And so this is something especially good, like if you're going on the road or hanging out, this is something you can listen to and can be kind of nice and relaxing instead of having to read books. If you're tired of hunching over a textbook and reading. So I think there are only like one or two audiobooks about Chinese medicine, but that's one of them. So that's kind of something I want to do over Christmas. Here, let me do, 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 do. Sparking the Machine is a very good book for all those who are very scientific and confused about the concept of qi acupuncture. Yeah, and yeah, and so that's that's why I thought this. Um, I almost feel kind of snooty because I'm one of those people that like will make these relations between Chinese medicine and Western medicine. Like I'm I'm not really into that. When people talk about like, oh, qi is like nerve conduction or like the san jiao is like the interstitial spaces. I'm personally, I'm kind of like, let's just talk about Chinese medicine in terms of Chinese medicine. However, all of your patients are not going to be like that. So sometimes it's good to have that vocabulary. So if you're talking to your patients, you can kind of explain this more in terms that they would be familiar with. So if they're not really into the magic powers of qi, you can maybe have some vocabulary to explain it to your um, patient in terms they can understand. So that's good. I've, um, I've heard a lot of good things about this book, so that's one I'm interested in reading. Hi, from Switzerland. What time is it in Switzerland? Are you... I think you're eight hours ahead. That's not too bad. Any recommendations for a pathophysiology text? Oh, no, that's, that's like not my specialty. Um, even when I was in school, people would ask me if I did like tutoring and it's like, I will do all the Chinese medicine, I'll do acupuncture and herbs. My knowledge of biomedicine is not that great. I'm kind of surprised I passed that module of the NCCOM of, the, of that test. The first TCM by book I read was Between Heaven and Earth. Yeah, I, uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong camera again. Yes, I, uh, that was one of the first books I read, too. That was actually when I was in India, and I was staying at this place that had an acupuncture clinic right next to it. Uh, I asked them about, hey, I want to learn more about Chinese medicine, and they had some books, and that was one of the books they had. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it was much more readable. It was, it, was, it was like a fun, more readable book. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about it. I feel like they went through the five elements, talked about them in, in, in certain archetypes and things like that. So, yeah, that's one book if you're just starting out in Chinese medicine or if you want to introduce people to Chinese medicine, that's a good book. Another one, a, kind of a standard one we, we recommend, is The Web That Has No Weaver by Ted Kapchuk. So, uh, yes, that, that's a good book. I, I read that book 10 years ago. I haven't read it since, so I don't remember a whole lot about it. But I remember enjoying it at the time. Because the other book they had was this book, The Fundamentals of Chinese Medicine by Nigel Weissman. And I tried to read this book. I'm like, this is so boring. This is putting me to sleep. I can't imagine reading this entire book. And so I switched over to that book, Men and Earth. Uh, funny story. I read that book. This was like I was in India. I was in Western Bengal, like middle of nowhere India. And I read this book, kind of funny, that when I opened the front cover, there was a stamp inside the front cover that said, Property of PCOM New York, Library, Do Not Remove from Library. So I thought it was funny that so like somebody took this book from a school and it ended up in India. Um, so I think that's all I have about books. So those are, like I said, those are just some fun books to read. Again, links uh, are in the description below. These are Amazon affiliate links. So like I said, this is something that if, if you click on those links and buy something that gives me a commission like 5%. So just to be very transparent, that's a thing that's happening. Uh, and like I said, it turns out those links and buy anything else in the next 24 hours, it, it throws me a commission. So. And then it's also, I know a lot of people are not very into Amazon, right? Some of these books can be bought on Eastland Press as well. So I think especially these two are published by Eastland Press. So I also put the, the link to their website in the description there if you want to 
if you want to get them not on Amazon. And I think and I think what's also good is when if you go to Eastland Press, then they also have the ebook version, and it's a little bit cheaper. So those are some options for getting those books. So those are some those are some recommendations if you're like. If you're reading textbooks and you're like, this is not enough, I need more. Or if you're reading textbooks and you're like, this is terrible, I want something fun to read. Then these are some books you can read. Let's talk about questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Go ahead and throw them in the comments below. I think I have some questions from last week. Speaking of books, speaking of textbooks, David is asking, what Giovanni Macchio's textbooks? I have Bensky Chen and many others, but have avoided Giovanni Macchio's books for some reason. This is about uh, layout, confusing terms, and so on. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge, I have to be careful about how I say this, I'm not a huge of Macchiocho, or, and I should try that by saying, um, some of it is not Macchiocho's text, it's more that the the approach people take to Machiocha's texts. Just I have these bad memories of being in school and where we had to memorize point prescriptions from that textbook that he had. He just has all the Zongfu patterns and all the and all the a list of point prescriptions for each Zongfu pattern. And we just had to memorize those and I was like, this is not how you do Chinese medicine. Um and I feel like even Machiocha felt that way, that he's saying these are some representative points. Uh, and he never meant for that to be the final word on how to do acupuncture. That was just a suggestion. But then it turns out the boards used that book, and so then we had to memorize those points in order to pass the boards. Anyway, I have some I have some not so great memories of that. Um, and Machiocha books. If we're specifically talking about foundation book, the fundamentals of Chinese medicine or the foundations of Chinese medicine. I'm not a huge fan of that book, and again, I should say that I had I had the second edition. We called it the Machiocha Silver because it's, it has a silver cover. I think now there's a third ed edition that has the white cover, and so I don't know what the third edition is like. When I was in school, we used the second edition, and um, I was I just wasn't into that book. I feel like he was the he's the opposite of concise. He's very verbose, or some some people even said bloated that. Uh, he uses a lot of words to say something that could be said in fewer words. And when you have to read, when you're like reading a, a thick textbook, I feel like less is more. Um, yeah, the colors kind of weirded me out. Something about his color scheme. He had some diagrams and he would always have some boxes summarizing. Like he would have a section of uh, a chapter section and then he would have a box summarizing that section. But sometimes the box like floated into a different section. So you're like, which, which, what am I reading? So those are just nitpicky layout things. The other thing is, um, some of the disagreement I have with Machiocha or some of the things I don't really like are, he, he sometimes inserts his, his own clinical experience into his textbooks. And I feel like that's that's totally fine, that's okay, as long as he's acknowledging it and other people are acknowledging it. And I feel like that doesn't necessarily happen all the time. So sometimes so sometimes he'll say, like, in my clinical experience, these points can be used for this. And, and uh, again, I think that's totally fine. But what happens is after that, people take this as fact, and they can't distinguish between what is written in the classics and what is one practitioner's opinion. And so I feel like sometimes that gets mixed up. So when he talks about like uh, the great rule of the stomach channel, he says, in my clinical experience, I use stomach 40 to affect the great law of the stomach channel or the great law connecting stomach channel. And it's kind of like, that's cool that it's his clinical experience that gives us some guidance, but we shouldn't take this as like, this is the fact that comes from the classics that stomach 40 is, is this point. So sometimes there are things like that. There are other things. There's a Machiocha Gold book that goes over channel theory. I kind of really don't like that book. I feel it's like that was a required book in, in some of my classes, and I feel bad telling us to buy it because I didn't like that book where he goes over um, the secondary channels. And that reason I didn't like that one is, again, he like he kind of injects his own interpretation 
into some of what he writes. And so there is one part where he talks about the order of the channels, and he said the order of the of the channels is um, Tai Yang Xiao Yang Yang Ming Tai Yin Jue Yin Xiao Yin. So he flipped the last two channels. Usually we say it's Xiao Yin and Jue Yin is the is the deepest channel or the terminal channel. He flipped them. And I could never understand why. Because this was something that came, like it comes from the Nei Jing. I went and looked at my Nei Jing and the Nei Jing clearly says that it's, um, when we talk about a door, that it's Tai Yin to the outside, uh, Jue Yin is like the interior, and Xiao Yin is the pivot. So Xiao Yin exists in the middle, but he was saying no, Xiao Yin is the terminal one. And this was really confusing to me because like I had to teach this in a class too. I was like, why is it one way in this book, but when you look at like Wang Ju Yi, it's different. What's how do you how do we explain this? And after I did some digging, I found a blog post where he where he wrote about this. And he said that even though it's written in the Neijing this way, literally, I interpret it as being this way. And then he gave some arguments, and I just thought that's 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 cool that that's your interpretation, but that's kind of weird to put it in a textbook. So I think at this point I'm just ranting about Machiocha, but it turns out uh, there are there are some Machiocha books I really like. Um, I have his his tongue diagnosis book is really good. Uh, he was really careful about the uh, the pictures, so it has really good pictures of the tongues. His descriptions of the, the tongues are really good, and then he has really good pictures where he describes them, and he was very careful about getting accurate lighting for these pictures so that they would come out right. Um, yeah, this is something I feel like I should make a video about because there are a couple different ways we can interpret the six levels. You say Shaoyan is a terminal because everything protects the heart. And yeah, I, I kind of understand that argument. Um, I, I kind of think of it as Jue Yin is the terminal level. One, because the term Jue Yin means terminal Yin or reverting Yin. So kind of the name is implying it's the last one. But also the Jue Yin includes the cardium. And so I guess my interpretation is it's the pericardium that per part. If something gets past the pericardium, it's like they're, they're like... If, it, if it's at the stage of the heart, it's too late, you're too far gone. And so it's really, it's, it's the pericardium should be the terminal stage. And then also this gets into, are we talking about disease or are we talking about channel channel function? So when we talk about Jue Yin as reverting Yin, we're talking it's extreme Yin that's transforming back into Yang and things like that. And we're also talking, um, when we say the channels act as pivots. And so that's literally in the Neijing, it says the, the Shao Yin is the pivot between tie in and uh, jue in. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I think it, it deserves more discussion because people, a lot of people ask, why is the Shang Han Lun different from uh, channel physiology? When you talk about the Shang Han Lun and the order of quality, we say it goes tai yang, yang ming, shao yang. But when we read Wang Ju Yi, he says the order of channels is tai yang, shao yang, yang ming. So again, we're flipping the two. And a simple explanation for that is in the Shang Han Lun, we're talking about the order in which cold damage penetrates this, the six levels. When we're talking about channel physiology, we're talking about physiological depth or functional depth of the channel. So we can kind of make a distinction there. But that, I guess to explain that, I need to be able to draw pictures and stuff like that. So, so this is just one of those things where different people have different opinions about how things work in Chinese medicine. So... And that's one of those things about um, TCM is that we can have multiple theories and they can all be true simultaneously. So it's not, we don't necessarily have to say that one is right and one is wrong. It turns out that two different things can be true at the same time. And that's just the nature of Chinese medicine. Oh, this is really good to know. Also, right, also look that out. Um, has a website which has a lot of the classics. Yeah, so that's really good. I, I found some websites that have like the Tao Te Ching and stuff like that, so that's really good to know that it has um, the classics.
from the Hua Tu map where uh, Jue Yin has the most Yin inside. Oh, that that's that's interesting to know. That's that's one of those things where I don't I don't necessarily know where all these things come from. So I have to I have to look that up. I don't know much about the Hua Tu, and sometimes we get into the stems and branches, and that's just something I don't know a whole lot about. Um, but again, it's when you if you look at uh, Wang Juyi, he has some really good explanations about what it means for these various levels, what it means for a channel to be a pivoting two channels and things like that. So I kind of go with that. Machi Ocha has a different interpretation and reading his interpret reading his arguments, I didn't feel very convinced about that. So I was kind of upset that he put that in a textbook. But um oh but I think I might have been talking about his other books. So the 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 tongue diagnosis textbook uh Machi Ocha I really like. There's a gynecology textbook by, or a gynecology book by Machiocha that is really good and a lot of people like that. There's also another book, we would always call it the Machiocha Gold because it has a gold cover. And I think it's called like The Practice of Chinese. And so that's it, this is a really good reference book, um, especially when you're first getting into practice because it goes through a bunch of disease, disease names like insomnia, uh, things like that, headache, things like that, just the just the disease names, and then he'll lay out the patterns associated with each disease, how to differentiate those patterns, do a differential diagnosis, and he'll give you some treatment guidelines. So it, it's really a good like handbook of if you're not sure what to do, you can kind of go there and kind of narrow down your diagnosis and things like that. So that Machiocha Gold book is really good. I really like that. Um, so, so it's really just that I have real memories of that Machiocha Silver book, the found the fundamentals. So I like the night this book, the Nigel Weissman book. I like this book more for fundamentals. Uh, this is something that uh, when I started uh, acupuncture, I had a teacher who was very into Weissman and very Weissman terminology, and so he was a, a big fan of this book because he, uh, the the terminology. Um, when I first read this book, it was really boring. Like, I couldn't stand it. It, it was, I'd read a couple pages and it would put me to sleep. But this is something that when I come back to it years later, when I was, like, studying for boards or when I want to look up things later, now I really like this book because it's like the things it's saying actually make sense. So I enjoy the style. I enjoy the concise language of it. So uh, this may be uh, a bit dry for a beginner, but if it's something that you already know some things, I feel like this is much more concise, I, and I like it because it's a translation of a Chinese textbook. This wasn't actually written by Nigel Weissman. This was a translation by Nigel Weissman that was published by the People's Republic of China. So, so I feel like we're getting it from the source, and, and so it's not. there's no practitioner opinion in here. This is what they're teaching in China. It's also kind of funny because it does, like, it occasionally in injects some politics in there, which... which I think it's kind of amusing. Like sometimes it will say like, in the distant past, people were suffering from disease and malnutrition. They didn't have enough to eat. But thanks to our glorious government, now people don't suffer from these diseases anymore. But there's kind of some, some propaganda in here, which I find amusing. So it, it's kind of interesting. It got injected into a textbook. And from an outsider's perspective, I think, oh, that's, that's kind of neat. I hope I was learning too much about Machiocha. I think it's just I have bad memories from school. But a lot of his books are really good. I'm just not into that. It's Machiocha Silver. Um, other questions from last week? I think I have more. If I can find the right button. What's the difference between a deficiency and collapse? Like Yang deficiency versus Yang collapse? This is a good question. This is something I kind of want to make a whole video about so I can have diagrams and stuff like that. Uh, simple answer, deficiency versus collapse. Uh, collapse is something that happens, it's very extreme and usually pretty sudden. Uh, we might compare it to like going into shock. And so if you have just a yang deficiency, usually that's something that it can be constitutional, it can be something that happens over time, and it can be mild or severe. Like you could have um, just yang deficiency, like the patient is a 62-year-old male and he gets up five times per night to, to pee. That could just be like, oh, he has kidney yang deficiency because he's getting older and it's constitutional and um, it's kind of an inconvenience. When we say yang collapse, that's more like you're passing out. 
this is like you're curled up into the fetal position. In America, we say the fetal position. I think in China, they say you're curled up in the shrimp position. You're sweating. Your pulse is very, is faint and very and barely perceptible. This is like an emergency situation. This is not just like, oh, my yang's a little depleted. This is like, yang has abandoned me, and you're, it's, a, it's an emergency situation. Um, so for collapse, I think we have two terms. One is wang, W-A-N-G, and another is tuo, T-U-O. I think wang means collapse and tuo means desertion, or I might have it the other way around. But, but as far as I know, these are two terms that, at least in the modern context, we can use interchangeably. So we can talk about yang collapse, yin collapse. I think we can even have collapse of essence. Uh, we can have qi desertion. We can say yang collapse or yang desertion. And usually collapse or desertion, there's, there's something that cause, like an event that causes it. So this would be like uh, profuse blood loss and the qi flows out with the blood could cause qi collapse or yang collapse. This could be uh, a sickness where you're um, uh, like a severe loss of fluids where you have vomiting and diarrhea and you suddenly lose a lot of fluids that could cause collapse. Or this is something like you're out in the cold and that causes yang collapse or you were fasting for a long time and you sat in a sweat lodge and then you passed out. That could be like a yin collapse. So it's usually more sudden, and there's usually something causing it. Um, I had one. I had one teacher that I think he gave an example that he had a patient who was an older patient, and he had gone to a hospital to get an IV injection. I'm not sure if it was just saline solution or if it was something else, but it's something that they had, they had just uh, taken these, these fluids out of the refrigerator and then immediately hooked it up to him. So they're giving cold fluids. And so when he, when he came home, he was very listless. He wasn't talking. He had no energy and things like that. And so what the practitioner did was do moxa on Ren 8 and that like restored his yang. So he immediately had more energy. He was able to get up and walk around. So that might have been like a sudden influx of cold. I don't know if we'd call that yang collapse, but that's something that comes to mind. Um, what else was I going to say about that? Then you have collapse of, yeah, yeah, so I, I looked this up in uh, Nigel Weissman's Practical Dictionary of Chinese Medicine, and he was talking about, like, extreme exertion, uh, sudden loss of fluids or extreme loss of fluids, loss of blood, things like that. And then one of, one of the things he mentioned was uh, sudden and extreme loss of seminal fluids and essence. And so I thought that was kind of funny. And you're like, oh, I ejaculated so much, my essence collapsed. I'm not sure if that's a normal thing. Um, so, so usually it's uh, uh, sudden and rather severe. There is such a thing as vacuity deser desertion, which I think happens more over a long time when you have long-standing deficiency that the, you, it can wear you down and then your chi can desert or abandon you. But normally we're talking about like something very, um, something sudden, something relatively extreme, and it's usually like a medical emergency. So that's collapse. That's a good question. I'm not sure that was very clear. Maybe I'll make a video about it later. What else do we have? I'm bad with my buttons today. Oh, this is interesting. What's the difference between chiropractic and tween ah? That's kind of an inter interesting question. Um, I guess tween ah, I wouldn't really compare to chiropractic. I think of tween ah as more like being a type of massage. I think tween ah means um, like pushing and grasping. So I think more about like soft tissue manipulation, whereas chiropractic, I think more about uh, bony manipulation. Um, but, but I guess this is interesting because I feel like there is a style of tuina called junggu tuina. Jung means correct or upright. Gu means bone. So it's correct the bone tuina. And in that one, they're doing more manipulation of the bone. So that's, that's very similar to uh, what I think chiropractic is. So I think, so I think those are, are very similar. They're just maybe different styles. They came about in different ways. I think chiropractic just came about separately and they were... Originally, the person who made it was more focused on the spine, whereas uh, tween ah bone setting, I think they're more, they're not necessarily focused on the spine. Um, and also, at least the sense I got from the people who did Jungu tween ah is that 
their method of bone setting or their method of uh, bony adjustment is, is much more gentle. It's much more natural. So kind of the idea is if you loosen up the surrounding tissues and you align things correctly, then the bones will fall into the place. Whereas when I think of chiropractic, I think more of forceful adjustments. So that's maybe a difference, but that probably depends on the style of the practitioner. Um, but yeah, this, this is really interesting that um, I, I do think this is a useful thing. Some people are not into chiropractors, but I do feel like a useful thing that, you know, sometimes I get, uh, I've had patients come in and it's like, oh, I have this pain in my shoulder. It hurts when I breathe in and it this pain just won't stay. And, and so I try to do acupuncture and it doesn't always work that well. They still have like pain on inhalation. And I'm kind of like, I think you have a rib out of place. Like just go see a chiropractor and have them put your rib back in place. And they do that and it helps. Um, I've had the same thing with like uh, SI joint problems. It could, it, I think sometimes some adjustment of the, the bony structure can have an immediate relief in pain. And then we just have to do strengthening things outside of that in order to make sure that things stay in place. After you put things in place, they stay in place. Oh, I think I ran out of questions from last, oh, not that one. I think I ran out of questions from last week. That was all my questions from last time. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Let me go look at those. I lost my camera. Oh, what's your favorite book for points? We're using Machiocha and I just kind of reading because it has sporadic and... Uh, Machiocha are using the Machiocha, the... Again, I call it the Machiocha Silver. The third edition is not silver. Are you using the Machiocha uh, Foundations text or the other one? Basically, I, I use Deadman. I'll have my copy of Deadman up here. But for points, I, um, I like Deadman. Uh, he has really good pictures and really good descriptions and really good commentary. Uh, the other book we use is the CAM, the Chinese Acupuncturing Moxibustion. Sorry if there's sirens in the background. I live next to an emergency room. Um, we also use the CAM, Chinese Acupuncture and Moxibustion, and that can be good because it's more concise, uh, but it doesn't really have, um, doesn't have the same kind of commentary that Deadman has. So I really like the Deadman a Manual of Acupuncture. It's an orange book, and so that's a really good book. He also has uh, little flashcards that you can use. Also, the app is really good. People have been telling me they, I think his app is like $45, and that seems really expensive, but the people who get it really like it. Um, so you can also, he also has an app that's good. I think it has all the information, and I think it also has videos locating the points. So uh, maybe the Deadman app. Yeah, and the 40, yeah, stomach 40 is the wool connecting point on the on the stomach channel, Yang Ming channel. So usually what most people remember about that is they say stomach 40 for phlegm. So stomach 40 is good for phlegm. But we can also look at the, the pathway of the low connecting channel. Um, also, the, the we have a pathway that, uh, the divergent channel, I think, that goes to the... So you can see stomach 40 treats some Shen problems, especially when there's phlegm. And then, um, yeah, according to Machiocha, that's how he accesses the great little connecting channel of the stomach. Make sure I'm referencing the right side because it exits under the left breast specifically. So that's the point he uses for uh, the great looking stomach channel. How and where do you get copies of the original text like the Nei Jing? Um, there's a lot of different translations. Um, I think Huang Huang. I remember there was one translation that was really big. It was it had a yellow cover and it was really big. And we call it the pizza box one. And it had both the Neijing and the Nanjing. And I think it was by Huang Huang, but I can't, I'm not sure. But Huang Huang translation. The translations I really like are by Paul Unschuld. Let me see if I can type that in. Paul Unschuld. He has um, uh, copies of the Neijing and the Nanjing, and I think his Neijing is just a translation. No, it's a translation, but it also has footnotes in it too, so in that one it's footnotes. I like his copy of the Nanjing, the classic of difficulties, because he gives a translation 
uh, of, the, of the chapter, and then he has commentary. But the commentary isn't his commentary. The commentary is translations of scholars throughout the centuries, and so he translated the, those commentaries. So some of the commentary is from the 12th century, some of it's from the 17th century. So he translated the Nanjing, and then he translated other scholars' Uh, commentary on the Nanjing. So for the Nanjing, I, I, I really like the Nanjing, so um, I definitely recommend uh, Paul Unschuld's translation of the Nanjing. I feel like one year at Symposium I ran into Zev Rosenberg and he um, he wrote a book uh, about the Nanjing Ripples in the Flow. He wrote a book. He wrote a book that was a commentary on the first, uh, the first section, the first twenty or so chapters of the Nanjing. And so I asked him, "What's your preferred translation of the Nanjing?" And I think he said Paul Unschuld as well. So I was, I was happy about that. But again, these like these translations aren't cheap. I think Paul Unschuld's Nanjing book might be like eighty dollars. His, his Nanjing book comes in. Um, multiple volumes. I think his, I think the Su Wen, he divided into two volumes and the Ling Shu is in one or two volumes and like they're, they're not cheap, but they're, but they're very books. See if there's any other, other questions. Sorry, back up because I missed things at the beginning. Between heaven and earth, we talked about that. Pathophysiology, we talk about that. Hi, Jen. I can't remember if I said hi before. Hi. We're in Ohio. I feel like uh, I used to live in Kentucky, and everyone wanted to go to Cleveland. Apparently, that's a hot spot to go. Oh, yeah. And and so if you talking about links to where the, you can buy these, uh, yeah, there's uh, there's links in the below this video. They're Amazon links. They're Amazon affiliate links. So um, if you click any of those links, I think it's, it's like four and a half percent. It's not real great, um, but it's something. And then it actually turns out if you buy anything else, even if you like click on that link and don't buy the book, but you go and buy a toaster, it'll still give me some small percentage of that. So it's not a lot, but it's something if you just want to support the channel. If you're like, I'm going to buy books anyway, and I don't want to join your Patreon. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate that. Like I said, it's, it's not a whole lot. I think it's like, I put affiliate links under my videos, and I get like 18 bucks a month. It's like really not that much, but it's, it's something. So if you want to do it, that's really cool. Okay, good. Jen just said she just checked the uh, of acupuncture. Yes, that's that's kind of like our standard textbook for points. So when we go through points one, two, and three, that's the book that we use. Um, again, it's not cheap. This is one of the, I think it's like hundred twenty or hundred thirty dollars. It's not cheap if you get like, and I, and I feel like if you go on Facebook, at least around me, there there are a lot of people selling their textbooks, which always makes me sad. But after they graduate, they're just like, I don't need these anymore. And so they sell their textbooks. And so sometimes it's easy to get uh, deals on used books. Um, mm, 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 mm. But yeah, it's really good. Sometimes it's another one that it can be a bit overwhelming if you're first starting out. So um, come on. So if you're if you're first starting out, sometimes like reading the Deadman can be uh, really uh it can be a bit much it can be a bit much um because it's like it's one of those things like if you're a points one student and you're just starting out it's like maybe you don't want to read five pages of commentary about li4 you just want to know that li4 is right here and it's the command point of the face and it's good for really releasing the exterior and if you're a points one student that might not be that might be good enough but um it's something that you can come back to later and so it's like when you've been practicing for a while maybe it's really interesting to go through and read four pages of commentary about li4 uh, but also the the pictures are the best the best pictures we have in terms of locating points oh this is good to know z library has lots of tcm books uh i'll have to look that up i'll have to i'll have to google that I'll have to Google it. I'm, I'm looking in the wrong camera. I'll have to Google that. Um, I haven't heard of that. So if you have a link, uh, maybe put that in the, in the comments. 
How do you decide which points to use for a disease? <laughs> Sorry, there's there's not an easy answer to that. This is this is like you you go to school for four years, um, and so I guess there are different approaches to it. Man, I feel like that, that my camera's crooked. That always bothers me when it's like it's leaning off to one side. I think I, I think I knocked my tripod. Anyway, how to uh, how do you choose points? Um, there there are a couple approaches you can take to it. Um, some people are very much like if you have this disease, we like look in a recipe book and you choose these points. These points treat this disease. Um, you could take more of a like we talked about that Machiocha book, the practice of Chinese medicine. You can look at a disease and then. Uh, break it down into possible patterns so that this is a very like flow chart way of doing it You're like this person has insomnia. Okay. What are the per pa uh, Possible patterns for insomnia. We can have patterns like liver fire or phlegm We can have deficiency patterns like liver blood deficiency heart heart chi deficiency heart blood deficiency And we can kind of look at the the different signs and symptoms to decide which pattern uh, is the person really hot and has red eyes? Let's look at liver fire. Does the person have difficulty falling asleep or difficulty staying asleep? That can tell us, is it more yin deficiency or is it more blood deficiency? And so we can kind of use a flow chart to uh, find this particular pattern and then use points that treat that pattern. Um, if you want to get more subtle about it, then it's like you can get really into taking the pulse. You can understand the way the chi flows in the body and you can think about using points in a way that alters the flow of chi to create a state of balance and that's kind of very that's a, that's a more subtle way of doing it rather than just saying this person has insomnia i'm going to needle heart seven and spleen six you can think about how is the how is what's the relative excesses and deficiencies in the channels how will needling these points affect the flow of the chi through those channels? And how can I how can I rearrange things so that they create balance? And so that's that's a very long and very difficult practice. So there's no way to do it. Oh, Columbus, Ohio. Oh, I, I tried to click on Gen Fox. Columbus, Ohio. I'm trying to think if I've been to Columbus, Ohio. I think there might be because there was one. I'm in Michigan, and so we would always go to the Toledo Zoo because that was our closest zoo. So when I was in school, we'd take field trips to the Toledo Zoo. Um, and then my dad worked in auto racing, and so there's there's a track somewhere. I think it's in Columbus. Um, yeah, Columbus International Speedway. We would go down there to, to watch cars go around in circles. Um... Let's see if I can read this. It may be a strange question. How Paul Unschuld translation? I try. It's very confusing. Um, I guess I, I, I'm not sure I've run into that, where he uses different words for the same characters. I would say one problem I had with it, I think he has a new edition out, but, at least the, but the edition I have is that when he translated as Chinese, he would use Wade Giles instead of Pinion. And he would use some weird translations, too. So, like... Instead of acupuncture point, he would say acupuncture hole. So we talk about the holes. We talk about the gushu hole. And so that, so that was kind of interesting, some of the, the choices he used for translation. Also, it was annoying because when he talked about points, he didn't use the point number. He just used the name of the point. And he translated the name of the point using Wade Giles. So he would, like, talk about this point, and I'd have to, like, go from Wade Giles to Pinion and then find what point number he was talking about. So I remember having problems with that. I'm not sure. He, he's come out with a new edition of his Nanjing. I'm not sure if he's changed that. Um, but yeah, the Nanjing, I mean, the classics can be really difficult to read because they're really confusing. And I feel like no, that's why we don't really, we usually don't study them directly in school. It's usually like you're reading a textbook and that textbook will make references to the classics. And so you might be reading Machiocha and he'll he'll make some quote that like oh this is a deficiency tonify the mother in case of excess drain the child from chapter 69 of the nanjing and so it's like we don't usually study them directly and so yeah it can be really difficult i'd say just kind of like read it and it's kind of hard to sit down and just read it for a while sometimes what i do is i'd like flip around or like i'd read something i just like read a passage and be like i'm just going to read one passage today and see if i can make any sense of it so um
So, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I have a good uh, answer for that. If you don't mind my Chinese copy. Yeah, that's, that's kind of another reason I liked uh, the Unchilled one is because he has the original Chinese, the Chinese characters, and then he has his translation, and then he has commentary. Not his commentary, but commentary from other Chinese scholars. Um, I'd also say, like, I have this tendency to skip around. Like, I don't, I don't think I've ever read it cover to cover. It's more like I read different, or maybe I'll see something referenced in a textbook, and then I think, oh, I want to read more about that. So then I go and, and find that chapter in the Nanjing and read about it. So, um, yeah, and some of it's really weird. Some of it, like, we don't actually use anymore. Like, so the Nanjing is all about five phase correspondences. So that's kind of a thing you can pick out that everything comes in fives. And we even talk the five types of diarrhea. And I don't use that anymore. We don't talk about the five types of diarrhea. So, so, so it's something you can just, I think it's kind of just fun to read through and not be too serious about it. Yeah, and that's the other problem we have is, um, I think there's a problem with sometimes it can be hard for um, English speakers to even understand Chinese because a lot of Chinese is very contextual. A lot of Chinese characters can mean different things. And I mean, even in modern Chinese, it's very, it can be very different for uh, non-Chinese people to grasp. The problem becomes so much larger when you're talking about medical Chinese, when you're talking about Chinese that was written uh, 1,000 or 1,500 years ago. And some of those some of those Chinese characters are used very differently from the way they are today. So I mean, in English, think about like uh, reading modern English versus reading Shakespeare. Sometimes we have trouble reading Shakespeare, and that was only like a couple hundred years ago. Uh, it, it's it's even bigger when we're talking about medical Chinese. And so it's like tr imagine trying to read uh, a book about anatomy written in Shakespearean English. Um, so that can be really difficult. And so the, and so that's why I think sometimes it's good. Um, uh, I like the ones with commentaries, and especially when they're uh, commentaries by Chinese practitioners from about from Chinese. So that can maybe make it a little bit better. Sometimes it's easier to read it in like from a textbook. So sometimes when you like read a book like this, it'll have it'll have references to the classics, and so so that's something you can kind of read it in the context of a modern textbook, and that might give you some some insight as to what they really meant. Hi, hi, Iceland. That's really cool. Hope everything's well in Iceland. Marco. Hi, Marco. Ooh, any flow charts out there for the patterns? Um, I don't have any. I feel like I had some in school. And I think what actually happened is a student made the... made. Just from from his notes, he made a, a bunch of like charts and tables, and then then they were, they were actually so good that the teacher took them and started using them, and those were our like handouts for class. So uh, I don't have any, but it's sometimes I feel like this can be a good thing to make that you can um, if you get a textbook, you, that's that's a way you can study is go through and make those yourself and make them in a way that makes sense to you. So, uh, like tables, I had one was. Um, Basically, it had a disease, and then it had columns uh, based on the different patterns, and then it would have the signs and symptoms, and it would have another, another row for tongue and pulse, and then it would have another row for point bin. And so this, that's something that you can do to kind of help you study is to make your own. Um, and I think I'll have to look at H.B. Kim. I feel like H.B. Kim has a lot of charts and things like that, so it could be that there are some existing ones in the H.B. Kim... Uh, handbook of Chinese. Uh, I forget what he calls it, but HB. We just look. We always just call it the HB Kim. There's a little HB Kim, which is like a little book that you stick in your lab coat pocket, and then there's a big HB Kim that you can use if you're studying for boards. And so that one has a lot of tables and stuff like that. So he might have some stuff about it. Uh, yeah, Silk Scrolls and Ma Wang Dui, because, yeah, that, that, I think that one we're, like, going back to 200 B.C., so, like, a lot of this stuff can be hard to interpret, and a lot of it, um, and then there, it's, like, there's an interesting thing of how much of it is practical in a modern context, 
Um, so, so that's like an interesting thing too, because sometimes you'll see something that's things in the classics like, um, I think this was in, in the Nanjing when it got to like, it's around, it's like chapter 72 or chapter 78. Anyway, when it talks about kneeling, um, it talks about, uh, yeah, it was chapter 72 where he says the superior practitioner favors the left hand, the mediocre practitioner favors the right hand. And he's talking about how to needle. And actually the Nanjing recommendation for needling is before you stick the needle in, you should press in with the full force of your fingernail. And it's like nobody. I, I've never heard of anybody doing that uh, anymore. And then when you when you go back to the the Neijing, the the passage it's referencing, I think the Neijing says before you insert the needle, you should scratch the point. And it's like I've never seen anybody do that. I've never seen anybody scratch the point before they stick the needle in. I've never seen anybody press their fingernail into. A, I feel like my patient would freak out if I pressed my fingernail with a full force into into a point. So so that's also kind of an interesting thing. Is like. Um, did they actually do that? Is the, should we should we take that literally that they were literally pressing their fingernail in, or were they saying that metaphorically that we should prepare the point and open the point before we stick the needle in, or should we say like that's weird and we don't need, we don't do that anymore? You know, back in the day they did ten cones of scarring moxa and we don't do that anymore. So that's kind of an interesting thing too. Um, and then like I said, there are some things that just even even theory-wise, we don't really do anymore in in, in terms of... Um, I trailed off and I forgot where I was going with that. But but there, there, there are certain things where we just don't... Um, we don't think about the medicine anymore, so... A textbook that compares Chinese herbs in a Western way, for example, Gansao, increases cortisol levels. Um, I was going to say, I feel like one of my teachers wrote a book. What was his name? I feel bad that I can't remember his name, but he, re he wrote a book about um, pharmacology. Greg Sperber. Uh, there's a book by Greg Sperber that talks about um, pharmacology and Chinese medicine, and I feel bad because I think he taught a class on pharmacology and I never bought his book. Um, so I, I'm not sure entirely what's in that book, but I think that book is mainly talking about drug-herb interactions. So if you're concerned about uh, Chinese herbs interacting with Western uh, pharmaceutical herbs, that's what this book was about. It's, it's a pharmacology book. I think it talks about the ADME scheme and things like that. So that's one book, uh, Greg Sperber. So I think if you just Google that, let me let me type that out, so you can see it. I think that's how you spell his name, Greg Sperber. So I think if you just Google Greg Sperber, that's probably going to come up. Um, I, I actually haven't read that book, but so maybe look into that first. The other one, uh, getting close to that, is the Materia Medica by Chen and Chen. So I think it's John Chen and Tina Chen. Um, the name of that book, I don't have a physical copy of that book, but I look at that book a lot. It's Chinese, it's like Materia Medica and Pharmacology or something like that. But So it's a regular uh, TCM Materia Medica. It goes through all the herbs. It's actually a really good book because um, it has good pictures. Like when you look at Bensky, he just has drawings of the plants. But in the Chen book, he has uh, photographs of the actual herbs, the cut herbs. So instead of being like, this is what a ginseng plant looks like, it's like, this is what a ginseng root looks like when you put it in a formula. Um, so he has good pictures. He has really good tables at the end. Like at the end of every chapter, he has really good summary tables. So I, I really like that book for at summaries. But anyway, with each herb, he, he does take more, he gives you the traditional Chinese actions of each herb, but then after that he goes through studies, uh, clinical studies they've done, and they're in terms of their Western effects. So he'll say like, oh, this drug has, or this, this herb has anti-hypertensive effects, and then it'll give you a study in which they studied this in China, or this herb, this herb has these effects, and then, and then it will also talk about some drug-herb interactions as well. So that's, that's the best book. It's kind of a mixture of TCM, uh, herb 
actions and then the the effects in terms of Western medicine. And he and he's really good at um, citing studies. I think the study high quality sometimes it's like in a study of twenty nine people done in and it's like that's not that's not a great clinical study, but it's it's at least something that they did in China. so. Uh, yes, I mentioned that sometimes. I don't, mm, mm, that's downstairs. I don't have that up here. That's uh, Weissman's Practical Dictionary of Chinese Medicine. So it's the same author. It's the same author as this book. It's Nigel Weissman. You probably can't see that. Uh, I reference it in some of my videos too. And like in a lot of the videos, I'll have that pop up and it will have a picture of that book pop up. Uh, yeah, that's also an in book. It goes through, um, it gives you definitions of Chinese terms. So if you're confused about different terms about, like like before we had a question about what's the difference between yang deficiency versus yang collapse, you can go to uh, Practical Dictionary of Chinese Medicine and look up yang collapse or yang desertion or yin collapse or yin desertion. Um, you can look up those terms to give you a definition of those terms. Um, so that's something that... This is another one that I have a hard time recommending to students. Um, I think there was another class at my school where this was a required textbook, and I'm like, yeah, you don't really need to buy that. Um, it's something that I really like because I, I study a lot. I like make videos and do lectures, and so I like to be very precise with uh, my terminology whenever I say something. But I feel like that's not necessarily super clinically useful. Um, and then I, I had some students that they like needed it for an assignment, and I was kind of like, you can just look at your regular textbooks. You can, you can look in your books like this uh, for an explanation of some of these concepts. Most books have a glossary, so like if you're reading Bensky and he says, oh, this herb transforms thin mucus, and you're like, what is thin mucus? He has a glossary where you can look up thin mucus, and they'll say, oh, thin mucus, that's the Chinese term is yin, and it refers to uh, flecting in the body cavities. It's sometimes translated as room. So it's like you can also just look in regular books. So I like that book. I'll be honest, um, I didn't actually buy that book. Uh, it was something that uh, one of my roommates was moving out, and he didn't want to move all his books with him, so he gave me some books, and that was one of them, Nigel Weissman's Practical Dictionary of Chinese Medicine. And I'll admit, for like the first couple years I owned that book, I used it as like a door prop, where I'd like use it to prop up my laptop. Um, but recently, as I've been, uh, when I started uh, teaching and lecturing, I wanted to be very precise with uh, with my terminology. And then I started looking into that more, and it has some it has some really cool stuff. But again, it's to me, it's cool because I've been doing this for ten years. I feel like if you're a first year student, it's probably pretty boring. I think that's it. More people from California. Hi, Mike. I should look at the right camera. Hi, Mike. So I think that's it. Um, that's for a little bit now. So if you have any more questions. Yeah, I was never good at anatomy and physiology. I feel like some of those classes I barely passed. Just because I wasn't interested in it. I was like, I'm here, to, I'm here for Chinese medicine. I'm not here for... Um, anatomy. Yeah, so Harshit is, uh, is saying, in India, we don't have Chinese herbs. Well, acupuncture is effective without Chinese herbs. Yeah, and, and that's, that's sometimes I feel bad because it's like I'm, I spend a lot of time talking about herbs because that's something in California, uh, not in all of America, but in California, we're required to er learn herbs. Learning herbs is part of our license, and learning herbs is something that a lot of people struggle with. So I spend a lot of time talking herbs, but I know that not everybody is interested in Chinese herbs. And so there, there are certain places in America where you don't herbs in order to practice. And then it's especially when you places like India and the Philippines and things like that, where you're not required to learn herbal medicine. So sometimes I feel kind of bad that I spend a lot of time talking about herbs when not everybody is interested in herbs. Can it be, can acupuncture be effective by itself? I'd say, yeah. Um, I think there, there are certain things that might be more effective with herbs and certain things that are more effective with acupuncture. Um, but it could be that if acupuncture is all you then yes, acupuncture can be effective. Um, I feel like in America, our main problem with herbs is getting 
patience to actually take the herbs. Uh, especially when we're dealing with raw herbs, not a lot of patients want to take raw herbs. They don't want to cook them. They don't. Wanna, they taste gross. They smell bad. They just don't want to take them. Even if you give them pills, a lot of times they'll forget to take their pills. Um, so in America, it's more of a compliance thing. I feel like in other places, it might be more of an availability thing. It could be that depending on where you are in India, you might not have access to the to um, Chinese herbs, and so. Um, in those cases, you can definitely, acupuncture is still effective. Uh, and then um, outside of acupuncture, you can still recommend things with like food therapy. So it's like if a person is really blood deficient, say they have infertility due to blood deficiency. Like this happened when I was in India. There, there, uh, uh, the patient came in, it was like a 22-year-old female, and she, she, she couldn't get pregnant. She really wanted, she really wanted to uh, have children, and she couldn't get pregnant. Um, she hadn't had a period in like six months. And so we were kind of saying the reality of the situation is it's very hard to tonify blood just using acupuncture because blood is very substantial. You need to add substance to the system. And so it, it was thing difficult that we didn't have access to herbs, so we couldn't give her herbs. And it was really like we need to eat meat. And we were just in an area of India where it, it wasn't really feasible for her um, to, to do that. So... Um, so I guess sometimes it kind of depends. It, it kind of depends on the situation, and sometimes, but sometimes like you have to make do with what you have. So certain 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 things like musculoskeletal things are really good with acupuncture. Things are really good with, acupuncture. but then there are some things that it's it's like herbs are option. If you don't have herbs, you can do food therapy, or maybe if Ayurvedic herbs there, you can you can go to that. Yeah, and this is this is kind of a David is saying. I think if you don't learn herbs, then you can't fully learn TCM, and that's something I kind of agree with. And this is something that we would get into. Different people would get into arguments at school about this because we had students who just didn't want to learn Chinese herbs. They're like, I want to be an actress. I don't want to be an herbalist. And yeah, I was one of those people that it's like the complete medicine includes herbs. Even if you're not going to be prescribing herbs, you should. It's like by learning herbs, that's going to help you learn Chinese medicine. That's going to help you learn about um, about diagnosis and treatment. I remember I had an intro class, and sometimes I would ask that, and I would teach intro to herbology, and sometimes I would ask that question. I would say, how many people here have no interest in learning herbs? And I'd always have a few people raise their hand, and I think that's, um, I think that's totally fine. I had some people that they're like, um, I'm a massage therapist, and uh, I'm a I'm a trainer, and I want to work on athletes. I really just want to do acupuncture. I want to I want to do acupuncture on my fighters or things like that. And I think that's okay. But I, I still kind of make the argument by learning herbs that will help you with acupuncture. And so because it turns out with herbal medicine, we have to be very precise with our diagnosis. You, it's not wishy-washy. I mean, it's like if you're doing acupuncture and you don't know the difference between heart chi deficiency and heart yang deficiency and heart blood deficiency, that's not really a big deal. You just needle heart 7, needle UB15, you'll be fine. But when you're doing Chinese herbs, you have to be very precise with your diagnosis. That if you have to know the difference between heart blood deficiency and heart chi deficiency, otherwise your herbs aren't, aren't going to work. Sometimes learning herbs can just help you narrow down um, can help you with the, that diagnosis and that treatment, and that will. And when you apply that to your acupuncture and improve your acupuncture, um, and some and a lot of the concepts overlap, and some certain concepts are just more clear in terms of Chinese herbology. And so when you talk about things like heart heat, Don Juye treats heart heat pouring into the small intestine. That's a, kind of a theoretical thing that also applies in acupuncture. So. I do feel like even if you're not into herbs, learning herbs can help you learn acupuncture and learning herbs can help you learn the medicine. And I kind of feel like uh, Chinese medicine was originally more of an herbal medicine. And so when you look at like the Shang Han Lun, there's not really acupuncture in the Shang Han Lun. That's an herbal text and a lot of our things that are like that. So um, I love your passion. I'm not sure. I think I just get angry at people. And so when... I, I very easily get angry at people, and I, I'm very strongly opinionated and a very angry person. So I think that's what it is. Um, and this is another this is another good uh, way to think about it, um, because I think 
because I feel like uh, I could be wrong about this. People in China correct me. I feel like when you learn Chinese medicine in China, you specialize in either external medicine, i.e., acupuncture, or you specialize in internal medicine, i.e., herbs. That when you go when you go when you study in China, you study both but then you specialize in one or the other. And a lot of times you have a department that specializes in one and the other. So you have people who are uh, majorly practicing herbs and majorly practicing acupuncture. They still do both, but you, but you have a specialization as internal action, uh, internal medicine versus external medicine. And yeah, it can be used for different things. If you have sciatica, probably better to use acupuncture. If you have insomnia due to blood deficiency, maybe it's better to use herbs. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know. I, I, was, I was joking with you. I know you meant that in a, in a positive way. So it's just that um, sometimes I'm very strongly opinionated. Sometimes I cause problems with my strong opinions. Oh, this is good. So a bachelor, you have to learn both, and then during your master's, you can specialize. Okay, so yeah, so that's good to know. Because cause some of my teachers, I felt like, um, they specialized in one or the other. So I knew that they did both, but um, they they would specialize in one or the other. And I feel like a lot of the hospitals had different departments that you had an internal medicine and an external medicine. Um, I feel like my some of my ch Chinese teachers also talked about that they would actually do other things like minor surgeries and things like that. That when you were a, a, a TCM doctor in China, that you could still do it. They would like perform appendectomies and things like that. So small surgeries they would still do. Uh, I think this is kind of funny. People say they specialize in everything. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. Um, yeah, and I think that's, a, I mean, it's especially problematic when I feel like I've run into people where it's like when they say they specialize in everything, they're not only talking about con uh, conditions, but they're like, oh, yeah, I do... I do Chinese medicine, and I do chakras, and I do uh, Ayurveda, and I do, and they like they list five things. It's like if you really do all the five of those things, like that means you're not good in any of them. Um, and so uh, specialization is something like I don't really have a specialty. I just say I do Chinese medicine because I feel like. Um, it is possible to be a general practitioner that like liver chi stagnation is liver chi stagnation, whether that's uh, causing infertility or whether that's causing insomnia or treating liver chi stagnation. So I don't specialize, but it's also, um, I feel like that's, uh, it's also, uh, traditionally, I think people did specialize. I think, uh, uh, Jeffrey Ewan, who's a, who's a Dallas priest, he talks about how he had to, how you had to choose a specialty and he chose um, women's health. So I think it is like traditionally you're supposed to have a specialty, but um, I never did that. Do, 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 do. Okay, good, oh yes. I'm glad there's somebody in China I'm not just making things up because I tend to do that sometimes. I think someone can uh, 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 confirm some of these things that, are, that I'm saying because it's like, I heard this five years ago from a Chinese person. I'm not sure if I'm remembering it right. So yeah, I think they did appendectomies. I think they could also do injections. And so it's like when you're talking about uh, non-collapse or chi collapse, it could be that they would do an IV injection or an IV of ginseng or zhenzhen. And so that's something that in the Chinese hospital they could do that, that they would have ginseng on hand ready to stick into an IV, whereas like in America we really wouldn't do that. Do, 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 do. Oh, here. But it will always be Western medicine combined with Chinese medicine. So you get normal anesthesia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I think that's that's kind of an interesting thing, too. That, um, again, I haven't been to China. I, I, I really wanted to go. And the last couple times I've tried to go, things have happened. But hearing from people in China, it seems really cool that they can, the way they can combine that. So a Chinese teacher was talking about uh, appendicitis and getting appendectomies. Uh, the story he was that if somebody had appendicitis, they would come in, they would put them in a hospital bed, and they would first try to treat it with herbs. And they would keep them, they would keep them monitored because if you have, like, really appendicitis, just appendicitis is not, that, not a big deal. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm gesturing to the wrong side. Appendicitis is not that, not that big of a deal. It's when your appendix bursts then it becomes a big deal very quickly. So if a person had appendicitis, they would bring them in, they would uh, 
uh, put them on herbs and give them traditional treatment. And then if, they, if something happened and they still needed treatment, then they would go and do the surgery um, and do the appendectomy. So, so it was really interesting. He, my Chinese teacher said um, he was talking to uh, an American MD, and he, and he said, in China, if somebody comes in with appendicitis, it's usually like 50-50 if they need to have surgery and get an appendectomy. And so he asked this MD, what's, what's it like in America? What percentage of people with appendicitis uh, end up getting surgery? And the doctor said, 100% of people with appendicitis end up getting surgery because if it's if it's they do it they just take it out right away. So I thought that was that was kind of interesting this kind of thing where they could uh, they could give a person uh, traditional treatment but m monitor them in a modern Western way and so they were able to do those things. Um, and, and so that was really cool and I, I think that's like the the a cool model of integrative medicine that they have traditional doctors and they have modern doctors and they're working together and I think that's a style of integrative medicine that I really like. The kind of integrative medicine I don't like is when people say like, oh this person has high blood pressure, that means they have liver yang rai. Oh this person has high cholesterol, that means they have dampness. I'm going to give them this damp formula. It's like, this person came back with labs and they have hyperthyroidism, I'm going to give them a kidney yin tonic. And I feel like that's that's not the way to do Chinese medicine. Uh, that's that's not the way to integrate Chinese medicine and Western medicine. We can use medicine as Chinese medicine. Look at the tongue, take the pulse, give herbs based on pattern, but then also have them monitored by Western medicine. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that, and that was kind of the interesting thing too. I thought when when I heard that story about the appendicitis is that you would think that like herbs are are way less expensive than surgery. Oh, that that was the other part, funny part of that story is my Chinese teacher had a friend um, who had to get his appendix taken out when he was in America, and so that that's kind of how that story started. He said when I was in China, we did appendectomies, and if somebody needed their appendix taken out. We charged them like $12. And then he had a friend come to America and had to have his appendix taken out. They charged him $25,000. And so he just, I think he just went back to China and uh, didn't come back. Um, and so that's an interesting thing where it's like herbs are way cheaper. And so, yes, they would do herbs before they do uh, surgery. The problem is in, in America, um, yeah, surgery is expensive, but keeping someone in a hospital bed overnight is super expensive. So I think that's the thing where in China, they would just put somebody in a hospital and they could have them stay there for several days while they monitored them to make sure that nothing went wrong. But in America, just staying, like lying in bed and being monitored is very expensive. So they, 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 they'd just be like, let's get the surgery and we can have you, have you out in a day rather than having you be monitored for a week. So that's interesting. Yeah, at this point, I, I think we're just shooting the shit, so. <sighs> that's a good word for it, homogenized. Yeah, we, I think that, um, I think it's good for them to go together, uh, but still, TCM can stand on its own. That we, when people start, I know a lot of practitioners who are nowadays getting into like we're doing blood tests, we're monitoring blood work, we're looking at your your levels of things like that. I'm like, mm, that's not, I'm not into that. Zhongjing didn't have a stethoscope. Zhong Zhongjing didn't have a sigma manometer. So it's like we can just take the pulse and look at the tongue. Oh, sorry, I can't read that. I missed it in and it cost us 4K and I was able to use gas and air without any drugs. Yeah, and that's... Yeah, I mean, I, I think in America, it's like... Maybe we shouldn't get in, into a, a debate about the American healthcare versus uh, national healthcare. Yeah, I wish we had more integrative medicine here. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and I feel, I don't, I don't know about the UK, but at least in America, I think it's getting a little bit better. I do know practitioners who work in hospitals, but it's still, uh, I think people are still very nervous about it, that it's like, if you're an acupuncturist, like they only let you treat back pain and things like that. They're not into it for the other stuff. And I think they're, they're real herbs. If, if someone is on medication, they, you don't take herbs at all. So um, 
so it'd be nice. So I think it's starting to get there in America, and I think it's especially like women's health clinics and fertility clinics are becoming more of a thing. But I think it has a ways to go before where China is at in terms of their integrative care. Do you know about the transition for doctors of oral medicine to go to school to practice in North Carolina? Do practitioners not like to say it's something like an end market? Um, uh, this is a, a complicated question because in America this really varies by state. And I know that in California we just had, uh, when I went to school we had a master's degree and now they just introduced the doctor of acupuncture in Chinese medicine. I think there are like three different letters for it. Some people say DACM, some people say DA, uh, DA, and there are a lot of different letters for it. And I think it, I think it, differ, it varies by state about what you can call yourself and what the degree is like. So I, I don't know a whole lot about that, I'm sorry. Um, but yes, at least, at least I know in California, like I got a master's of science in traditional oriental medicine. And I think now they have a transitional program that if I wanted to, I could go back for two semesters and become a doctor of acupuncture in Chinese medicine. And I haven't done that. Um, I think it's something we're specifically talking about marketing themselves. And I feel like that's why a lot of people do it. They want to call them doctor. They want to call themselves doctors in order to market themselves. And I have various opinions on that, and that's what, that's why I think that's why a lot of people I know went from the masters to the doctorate is because they wanted to be able to call themselves doctor and market themselves. And my opinion is, if you can make people feel better, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. So, I know a lot of people disagree with that, though. So I don't, don't want to be too um, too overly opinionated about that. Oh, more herbal formula videos soon. Maybe. Um, actually, it, it's kind of because like, I kind of like jump around all over the place, and so that's, that's a difficult thing where it's like hard to please all the people all the time. Um, because I've been doing a lot of herbal formula videos, um, I might actually switch back into acupuncture because they're like asking me about, like, are you going to do the rest of the channel? So I was thinking about next week going uh, doing an SI channel thing. Um, and so that's kind of like, I, uh, I kind of like overexerted myself where it's like, like if you go on my website, it's like, I have like five different things that are halfway completed. So it's like, I have herbs one that's like halfway done. I have herbs two that's like a third done. And it's really, I should just pick something and do that. But that, that, that's kind of boring. So I tend to jump around. So it could be that, um, I think I'm going to do uh, an SI channel thing, and then maybe after that I'll do a single herb category because I want to make more videos about the single herbs, and then I can throw in some herbal formula videos because um, uh, I think those those are those are a little bit more fun than just going through a category of single herbs. And then a lot of people have been asking a, a course, a review course for single herbs, and asking me about a review course for herbal formulas, and I do want to do that eventually. I might wait until next year to do that. I'm moving at the beginning of January, so I might wait until after that to start on that. And that'll probably take a while because when I made that single herb course, it took like three months. It's I was I was very procrastinating about it, but it took like it, it takes a while to make that. But uh, but I do want to make a, a review course for herbal formulas where we're just going to go through all of the formulas that are on nationals. I think nationals in California are, I think they're similar enough. We'll just do all of the formulas in one. And so I want to do that eventually. But maybe in the meantime, I'll make some of those individual um, videos. Some people are asking about like Liu Wei Di Huang Wan and stuff like that. Shen Chi Wan. You might be able to do that. Sorry, I lost my thing. Anything else? Yeah, I'm I'm very jump all over the place, and I feel like this 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 gets people mad because it's like I get halfway into something and then I get burned out and stop and be like, where's the rest of it? And then I like switch over to acupuncture, then I switch over to live streaming, and then I do a bunch of different stuff. So sorry about that, but it's like this takes a lot of work, and I'm I procrastinate and I get burned out really easy, so I like to jump around. Um, do you know any oriental medicine practitioners who are also naturopathic doctors? Yes, I feel like that's a thing. 
I know some people who are both MDs and acupuncturists. I know some people who are N, uh, naturopathic doctors and acupuncturists. I don't know if it's really necessary. Sometimes I feel like, like on the one, like like I had, uh, when I was supervising in the clinic, I had uh, some students who were MDs, and it was like really, it was actually like really useful when we had like things come in and I wanted to rule flags. It was really useful to have an MD on board that could, how to auscultate bowel sounds and uh, stuff like that. And he, some of them had really good bedside manner. They were really good at talking to patients. And so in that sense, it was useful. Sometimes when people come in with a Western background, it actually makes it more difficult for them to learn Chinese medicine. That the, especially with like nurses and things like that, they're so used to the Western frame of mind that it's hard for them to switch over to a Chinese frame of reference, to a TCM frame of reference. So sometimes that actually makes it more difficult. So. Mm -mm -mm. Any information? Uh, residency program in China. I don't know a whole lot. Um, let me switch back over. I don't know. I feel like I'm getting too close to the microphone. I don't know a whole lot about that specifically. Um, what most of what I've seen is like in when I was in my school, we had certain Chinese teachers who would take trips to China and do like an exchange with Chinese universities. So we had. Um, one teacher was from Beijing, so he would take students on a trip to Beijing for a month and they would, um, they had a program in Beijing Hospital. Or uh, I have one teacher from Chengdu, and so they'd go to Chengdu University and it would be like a three or four program. And it's, um, and it's like the university, the universities in China were really into it because they like to spread, they like to have America, they like to have Westerners who were enthusiastic about Chinese medicine. Um, I know some people that they did that as part of their doctorate program. I don't know if that was Yosan or Emperors, there, but there, I think there are some. There were some schools who did that as part of their doctorate program. I'm not sure if they do that anymore. So sometimes, if you're in a school, there's a program you can do that through your school. I'm not sure if it's possible to just contact a, a school directly to do that. So I don't know. Maybe maybe some of the the, the Chinese the people studying China might know more about that. But I did know people who would who would go to who would go to China for three or four weeks, and they would they would get to be part of a Chinese hospital. But it was more like it wasn't necessarily super strict studying. It was more like just just to get a taste of how they practice in China. So. Yeah, and this is this is a weird thing where it's like. This is an annoying thing about acupuncture and, and Chinese medicine, that the laws are different in each state. So, like, in California, you have to learn herbs. Uh, when I was in Kentucky, it's like you only, like, the NCCOM has four modules. I think you only had to take two of those modules, and herbology wasn't one of them. So it's like different states have different requirements. And then uh, sometimes different states have different laws regarding prescribing herbs. I think, like, in Illinois, it's really weird that you can't prescribe herbs. Yeah, this this table's really crooked and it's bothering me, so. Uh, yeah, Dwei Yao. Dwei, yeah, that's kind of an important thing. And so sometimes it's boring to just look at Dwei Yao's, but it's something that it's good to be able to recognize when you start learning formulas. So like when I was in school, we didn't have a Dwei Yao class. I think I've looked at other schools, like a, the Oregon school, they actually have a Dwei Yao class. Um, but our school, we didn't actually have a Dwei Yao class. It, it, it was just that when we got to form, we would sometimes point out the Dwei Yao's. And so... Um, so that might be helpful to have some actual information on Dwei Yao pairs, and that can be really good. When you're trying to break down a formula, sometimes it's uh, easier to think of things in Dwei Yao pairs. And actually, um, like when you talk about this 10 key formula families book, he talks about it in terms of individual herbs. We have the Guajir family, we have the um, Chai Hu family, we have the Huang Chi family. Sometimes I think it's easier to break it down in terms of Dwei Yao pairs. So it's like you have uh, Chai Hu plus Huang Qin, and you have a family of formulas that's based on that. You have, then you have Chai Hu plus uh, Bai Shao, and you have a family of formulas that are based on that. You have um, 
wager plus buy shall is uh, there's a whole family of formula. So it's uh, it's also a good way to uh, group formulas together in, instead of just based on their chief ingredient. You can based on the Dwei Yao pair that's doing most of the work. So I think that's it. I'm starting to run out of steam, so I think maybe we should call it here. If you have any more questions, go ahead and uh, leave them in the, the comment section below, and we can get to them uh, next week. Uh, I think next week, I'll just say next week, I, I think I want to do Friday at 4 p.m. I think for a while I was being kind of weird with the times because uh, I was like on call for jury duty, and I was never sure if I was going to get called in or not, so I was really weird with the times, but that's over now, so I think I can say right now, let's do Friday at 4 p.m., and I do like to vary things because there are some people who like to come during the weekdays, there are some people who are better at weekends, there are some people who I, I like to do it in the morning, but I know there are some people in, in Russia or the Philippines that it's like 3 a.m. right now, so... I'm thinking if we do it at 4 p.m. on Friday, that'll be like 8 a.m. in that part of the world. So that might be um, a little bit easier for some other people. So, so, so if you're wondering, like, why don't I just do it the same, same day and same time every week? It's just so I can accommodate different people. So let's just say for now, let's do Friday at 4 p.m. next week. If you have any questions for next week, if you're watching this on the replay or if I didn't get to your question, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. I'll check those comments and then I'll bring them in next week. I think the, we'll say that for now. Oh, Nikita is from Florida. I think I wanted to look at your pick because I'm never sure if Nikita is a man's name or a woman's name. I think in Russia it's uh, a man's name, and but in in the West it's become uh, a woman. So I want I want to make sure I I didn't I didn't use the the wrong pronoun. Um. Thank you, Nikita. I'm glad. Uh, I hope things are going well in Florida. Oh, what does your shirt, maybe we'll end on that shirt say. My shirt says, let me move over so you can see. My shirt says, this is the way. So this is a, uh, it's from the Mandalorian, uh, the the Star Wars show on Disney Plus. Mandalorian, they often say, this is the way. And so the kind of the joke is, this is the, the symbol for Tao, which means the way. So like Taoism is the way, or the Tao Te Ching is the way and its power. Um, I think this is also this is also Japanese kanji. They use the the same character for the way. It's do is the way. So like, um, comes up in martial arts a lot. Judo, uh, taekwondo, the the way, or um, karate do is the way of the empty hand. So this is just kind of a a joke that this is the character for the way. Um, the first line of the Dao Te Ching is Dao Ke Dao Fei Chong Dao, which means the way that can be weighed is not the true way. And so I thought well, that was kind of funny to have the man saying, this is the way. I kind of wanted to make a comic about, like, I thought it'd be cool to make a picture with, like, the Mandalorian and Lao Tzu, like, getting into an argument with the Mandalorian and being like, this is the way. And then Lao Tzu being like, the Dao that can be followed is not the true way. Anyway, that's that's kind of the, the joke of this shirt. Um... They're on Teespring. If you want, if you want one of these shirts, I have links in the description below to a, a Teespring store. If you wanna, if you want one of these. Oh, learned something new. Awesome. And so that's why I have my Baby Yoda here too. I have my Grogu here as well. So that's that was to go along with this shirt because it's a Mandalorian thing. Um, yeah, Jeet Kune Do is another one. A lot of a lot of um, martial arts end with Do, and that's and that's what this is. It's the way. It's, so it's like the way of the empty hand, or the way of the fist, or things like that. That's what the Do means. Um, I said we were going to stop, and then I like went on for another fifteen minutes. I think I said we were going to stop like five times, and then I just kept going. So let's actually stop for real next uh, next week, Friday at four p.m. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. If you wanted to get any of the books we talked about, those are there are links to those, Amazon links to those in the comments. If you want um, a nerdy shirt, there's a link to that in the comments. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out. Oh, that one. My camera shut down. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. See you all next week.
And uh, yeah, Zai Jin.